In 2014, the challenge was premiering its 25th season called Free Agents, a season many of its fans would deem one of, if not the best season in the challenge's history. I thought it would be fun to look back at Free Agents, see why it's so revered, and how was it received in its initial run. But to really understand Free Agents, we have to go a little bit further back than 2014 to get the full context of the challenge and its trajectory. Now around the time of seasons 10 through 12, the challenge was hitting a rhythm. By 2005 slash 2006, the show had a pretty decent sized catalog of personalities and competitors, as well as it was hitting a stride when it came to the format by making elimination games the standard and the daily challenges becoming bigger and better. Something else though that was major around 2007 was the cancellation of road rules. Since season two, the words real world and road rules had always been somewhere in the tagline or title of a challenge season. This was a major development because if you have a show that is only taking competitors from two other shows and one of those shows shut down, that's gonna greatly limit the amount of players that you can introduce in newer seasons later down the line. Hence how we got Fresh Meat Season 12 in late 2006. The show wanted a big influx of new players that could come in and be ready to compete. And it worked like a charm as that season had a ton of players that would go on to be labeled legends, icons, and massively shaped the show to what it looks like to today. From seasons 10 through 18, the challenge was like a well-oiled machine. It had a revolving catalog of some well-established, well-beloved characters and personalities. But we all knew at a certain point, the well was gonna dry up. People were getting older. They can't do reality TV forever, right? By 2010, the challenge was hitting a transitional period. Established cast members were getting too old and the effects of road rules being canceled for a significant amount of time now were putting things in an unclear space. They had to make some decisions, one of which was changing the name of the show. They would lop off real world and road rules and just be known simply by the challenge. Overall, this was a really good move for in the long run, they could cast a wide net to bring on people from all different types of shows, not just from MTV even, but from other networks, which some people have some critiques about. Big Brother sucks. Another decision they had to make was how to get more new players, like a lot of them, in a very quick amount of time. I'd like to welcome everybody to Fresh Meat 2. Looking back, the Fresh Meat series seemed to work out perfectly and help the show in massive, long-lasting ways. Now, I quickly want to get into some analytics and ratings at this time, as I think they can be a good indicator of how people at that time period are willing to buy into a season, watch it as it originally aired, and how invested they are into the season week in and week out. Now, very little information is known around the ratings prior to Fresh Meat 2. Like, we can see the premiere episode of season 18's The Ruins, and it looks really good especially compared to the ratings that happen on Fresh Meat 2. And we'll see Fresh Meat 2 has a tad lower tally than the seasons surrounding it, like seasons 20, 21, 22, and 24. There could be a multitude of factors of why people were more willing to watch those seasons more so than Fresh Meat 2. I mean, a couple of reasons could be that the short, straightforward titles are more enticing. Also seeing people paired up with their rivals and exes sounds a lot more exciting than seeing your favorites paired up with a complete stranger. Also between seasons 18 through 24, it felt like we were going into the last dance with some of the more well-established, long-standing vets of the challenge. Like during that time, we would see players like Veronica, Mark, Rachel, Evelyn, Landon, Paula, Derek, Darrell, Robin, Brad, and many more do their quote unquote swan songs for the challenge. Little did we know that Nobody's ever really retired from the challenge, especially now that the Challenge All-Star Series is a thing. Many of these players could come back and have come back. But at that time, there was a lot of mystery surrounding them. Like after this season, when would they be back? If they would ever be back? 
With a string of good ratings from seasons 20, 21, and 22, the challenge decided to do a little bit of an experiment. They were ready to throw a bunch of newer players at the wall like they were pieces of wet baloney to see who would stick with the audience. Season 23 was the second season to not feature any road rulers, which I'm sure at the time could have been seen as the new normal. As you can guess, the ratings were pretty lackluster, which led to them wanting to do a Rivals 2 for season 24. The ratings would bounce back a little bit, but by 2014, the challenge was hitting a bit of a crossroads. 2014, a year that was all about that base and telling your anaconda to shake it off. Chris Pratt was raking in the money from both Warner Brothers and Marvel, and Scandal was at the peak of its popularity. But the challenge, I will say, was not hitting its peak. Instead, it was trying to establish a new normal. With this new season, the challenge was taking major swings. This is one of the first times that we see the challenge taking on a more sports vibe, with the theme being free agents, as well as having numbers on the player shirts like jerseys. This is very interesting given some recent interviews and remarks about the production team of the challenge trying to label the show as America's quote, fifth sport, that they would adopt a more sports theme well before this idea of trying to rebrand the show as a sport, but also never really going back to a sports theme after wanting to establish it as America's fifth sport. Like they were more hyped recently about having like spy cosplay rather than being more sporty. A big addition that heightens this season is the draw. It put an emphasis on having players perform well. If you don't perform well in a daily challenge, you have the possibility of being sent into elimination. This was all an attempt to nerf bigger alliances and people just getting in with the numbers that made the game too predictable. A line that I will never forget comes from Frank. What was that? Strength comes in numbers, not personalities. Which to be fair, he's not wrong. But this was something that the show really felt was important to try to swerve. As you could see in season 24, they were trying to do something different with the voting system on that season and then completely turn everything upside down for season 25 free agents with the draw and the introduction of the kill card. This level of chaos added a tier of excitement to the game and put an emphasis on performance, like you had to perform well even if you weren't going to win the daily challenge, something that would get lost in later seasons. Now looking at some criticisms of the format draw and theme back when it originally aired, it looks like the reception was a bit of a mixed bag. I think nowadays the idea of unpredictability and punishing players who don't perform well is awesome and exciting. I can't tell you how many comments I've gotten on my videos or been in live chats where people desperately would love to have the draw and the kill card back on a challenge season. Now, of course the draw is not perfect. There are a ton of criticisms like Devin and Johnny were in the draw multiple times yet never saw a single elimination because of their luck. And on the flip side, Cora Maria went into multiple eliminations because of how bad of a luck she had in the draw. She had proven herself winning multiple eliminations. I just think it is impossible to make everybody happy on a given format or even a cast. But I do wanna say I love the draw because it emphasized performance. And if you didn't perform well, you had the opportunity to be sent into an elimination. And to be honest, I think a lot of players and audience members would agree that two major factors that lead to success on a challenge season is both performance and luck. And I think the draw embodies that to a T. Now, like I mentioned, the challenge was at a pivotal point. It had a ton of recently introduced characters that hadn't been fully developed yet and a very limited returning cast that it could lean on. Heading into free agents, the only returning vets that had premiered from season 18 and up were Anissa, CT, Johnny Bananas, Isaac, and Kahuta. And really, there's some asterisks to that group as well. Kahuta had only done two seasons prior to being on Free Agents and showed some heart on those seasons. Isaac had only done one season prior to being on Free Agents. So if you take those two players out of it, the only three long-term vets heading into this season were Anissa, CT, 
and Johnny Bananas. Everybody else on the cast had been introduced between the seasons of 19 through 24 and a handful of first year players that were making their debut on this challenge season. Now, that's not a bad thing because some of the players that had debuted during that time showed some real promise, but not a lot of them had much on their short resumes. Now, after talking about the cast and seeing the makeup of being mostly newer players and very small amount of long-term vets, you could probably guess after seeing the patterns I had already shown you about the ratings, that the ratings for free agents were some of the lowest in the show's history at that time. Take this comment from a Vebmo user by the name of Toenail saying, goodbye challenge. Now this comment is only funny because one, the show is still on. And two, that because the show dipped under 1 million viewers meant that the cancellation of the show was gonna be happening at any time. It's like, yeah, okay, you haven't even seen what Rock Bottom is. How did a season that had pretty low ratings and was made up of a mostly unproven cast be now classified as one of the best challenge seasons in its history and have this like cult following? This season was not just pivotal for the challenge as a show, but also pivotal for the cast, where it was like a turning of the tides for both newer players and older established vets. That with some players rising, some players were about to fall as well. You have Nani, who was looked at as a fiery personality on Battle of the Seasons, especially when Frank made disgusting remarks about her sister. Rivals too, Nani, wasn't really shown too much in the storylines, but it was in Free Agents where her relationship with Kahuta took center stage. Her then messy behavior between her relationship with Kahuta and then canoodling with Johnny Riley also took center stage. Then the petty argument with Camilla, I think really set up Nani's character and personality in the challenge and really locked her into a regular spot Moving from free agents on, Devin showed she is an incredible personality and has a good social game. And like I mentioned earlier, she is looked at as, I think, the luckiest player. I mean, in her two seasons, she only went to one elimination, big easy quit. She never had to go into another elimination ever again in her challenge career, and she greatly benefited from it. Leroy was very young in his challenge career at this time. He premiered in season 21, had a very promising rookie season, making it to the final, and then his next two seasons were kind of lackluster. I mean, he had a good elimination win against Wes in X's, but he didn't last long on that season. Season 24, he was paired up with Ty. They got lucky in one elimination because Zach's boneheaded move, and then lost a really close elimination against the rookies, Jordan and Marlon. Like he didn't get to a final this season, but he showed that he was a lot stronger. And if it wasn't for going up against CT, right before they swapped locations, Leroy possibly could have made it to another final. And also this season helped set him up for an incredible run in the very next season in season 26, Battle of the X's 2, because this is where Leroy and I have met, they had a fling, and then they were on Battle of the X's the very next season, where Leroy got second place and was back into a rhythm and being a staple on the show. CT was coming off a win, and really, this was the last time we saw a fun single CT on the challenge. I mean, we saw him playing in the basketball game with Teresa, but after this season was where everything would change. Because in the very next season, CT and DM would be prematurely disqualified because of medical reasons. CT would step away from the show for a couple of seasons. I mean, he was a mercenary on season 27, but wouldn't come back to compete competitively until season 29, Invasion of the Champions, and CT had done a complete 180 on how he would play the game and how his persona would be moving forward. Not to say it was worse, but it was just different, which would lead to way more success compared to what he was dealing with in the beginning of his challenge career. Anissa after free agents would kind of dip a little bit. From free agents and earlier, she was the elimination queen. She was looked at as someone none of the women wanted to face. But after season 25, Anissa's performance in Legacy took quite a downturn. She was less proficient in eliminations. 
she'd be left until the very end of the season to be sent in, not looked at as much of a threat, but someone's hope of an easy elimination matchup. Teresa would prove to be messy upon messy as she would be laser focused on starting this rivalry with Laurel, but also be paranoid and make the wrong decisions to have everybody be looking at her sideways. Zack was coming in as a recent champ. I'm sure many people at the time felt with his size, with his athleticism, Zack was gonna be the new person to win multiple challenge titles. And he was looking like he was on his way in free agents. But then he flopped in the final, which we would see him do multiple times in seasons afterwards. Jordan came off of a really good rookie season, making the final, but Jordan came in very arrogant and looking like a hothead. Him coming in, telling a four-time champ at the time that he had to quote unquote earn his stripes was really, really funny. But Jordan this season showed he means what he says and will do what he says, adding to his short resume, even if it comes to the detriment of his own game, that his word means everything. But even though on free agents, his mouth wrote a check his butt couldn't cash, we would later see him come back and bounce back and back up what he said and did for seasons to come. I think Car Maria benefited the most out of everybody on free agents. Car Maria prior free agents was looked at like the little engine that could. She was small, but she had a lot of heart and she had some raw athleticism. She had made it to multiple finals, but I think a lot of people had some question marks about what she could do solo wise. But in free agents, she came ready to play, so focused, had the heart, had the will, had the patience, had the motor, and she surprised everybody. This is where an underdog turned into the fan favorite. And this would be the jumping point and the momentum we would see her take into seasons to come and have a ton of success. Laurel coming into free agents was looking like a juggernaut. Prior to free agents, she had always made the final yet always came in second place. She was intimidating, especially physically. Nobody ever wanted to go up against her, yet she went into multiple eliminations, won every single time in both physical eliminations and puzzle on her way to the final and finally cashing in that check prize and title of challenge champion, cementing her in the record books and changing her narrative. And Bananas also benefited from this season as well. Even with him coming into the season as a four-time challenge champ, his win on free agents took him to new levels, making him the winningest player in challenge history. Fun fact, players featured on free agents would go on to win the next six consecutive seasons. And even pulling back further and looking at the bigger picture, somebody featured on free agents would go on to win 10 of the next 12 seasons of the challenge. But look, it's not just the format or the players or what the players do on future seasons. It's also what the players do on this season and what big moments happen on free agents that makes this season a joy to watch. You have a ton of fun moments, drama moments, make out moments that frankly, we don't get the chance of seeing in a modern era of the challenge. I mentioned it earlier, but CT and Teresa's basketball game. Bottles and models all night tonight, baby, bottles and models. I talked about Kara reaching new heights and she does that very early on in the season in the looper elimination against Naya. It was like a real, true David versus Goliath kind of battle and she lasted the full like hour and a half to push herself harder than she ever had to win that elimination. We find out that Isaac is still weird and hates sand. On top of sand, I'm a big, clumsy dumbass. We get a rivalry between a challenge legend and a budding star in Bananas and Jordan. What have you accomplished? You have nothing. I will mop the floor you with your ass. And not only does it get very heated, but we're not baited in being shown all this footage of how intense their arguments are to then have like Jordan be eliminated by some random dude or accident. Like they talk about wanting to go head to head with each other and we actually see it. And that's coming off of another huge moment, not just for Bananas or Jordan, but the challenge as a whole. Because Jordan had to flip all of the kill cards to ensure that he was going into the elimination against Bananas. He talked so much about it, it was alluded to the entire episode and it actually 
happened. Even though it was a very massively dumb moment for Jordan's game because it would lead to his eventual elimination, but it put Jordan on the map, it put the season on the map, and I think is one of the most iconic moments in challenge history. This season also has one of the weirdest daily challenges I've ever seen in my life called Sausage Party. And I mean, they have the competitors wrapped up in saran wrap looking like little sausages and having to roll around the beach, fake grills. Like, look at this, this is nuts. This looks fun. This is like a fun challenge that we never get to see anymore, but this is fun and weird. We have some of the best and stupidest trivia answers in all of challenge history. What is the official language spoken in Australia? Dutch. What continent does the USA belong to? Continent? What is Muhammad Ali's real name? Mahatma Gandhi. Then we saw the Cora and Laurel rivalry reignite. Coming onto the season, they were friends. And then they started to be rivals again. And just like I was talking about with Bananas and Jordan facing off against each other, we had this tension building with Kara and Laurel, two of this season's best, two of the best in challenges history, starting to not like each other again. And then they end up facing off against each other. Unfortunately for Kara, her hand was in a cast because she had broken it going up against Jessica in the Balls in Elimination the episode prior. And even after getting the cast, Cara Maria wasn't going to quit, which just added more to her becoming a fan favorite. And this is also where we see CT and Cara's friendship because it wasn't really shown up to this moment. Like we knew that they were kind of like from the same area, they were from Boston, and it was really difficult to see just how close they were prior to free agents, but I'm sure they were close and friends at some point during that time but it was free agents that we really got to see CT and Kara become friends. The surprise draw and elimination, you had Laurel versus Teresa, where there was this rivalry culminating throughout the entire season where only one could make the final. Then you had, of course, CT and Bananas right before then too, this rivalry between them. And you just knew that whoever won this particular elimination was gonna go on to most likely win the final. Then the finals, Laurel outperforming Zach, Zach flopping and making ridiculous noises in the final. <laughs> Nani being so close to winning. And then of course, like I said, Bananas becoming the winningest player in challenge history, winning his fifth title at the time. I mean, you could just see the through line and the thread of each storyline as I just mentioned some bullet points. I mean, just talking about the bullet points has me so excited about this season and just proves how good of a season this really is. When 10 years later, I'm speaking about these moments and still getting hyped and picturing them in my mind as I'm going through them. Going through this entire video, it's now easy to me at least to see how free agents is such a pivotal season of the challenge. It was a turning of the tides. It was a changing of the guard. It was the season that we saw legends being formed in front of our eyes. A season that wasn't the most watched at the time it was airing. Many didn't even know what the future of the challenge would look like. And I mean that as fans and production alike. But given the test of time, of 10 years now having been passed. Free Agents is still regarded and looked at as one of the best seasons in the challenge's history. Sure, it looked different from a cast and format standpoint, but the challenge was willing to take major risks back in 2014, and it paid off dividends. Going back to Toenail's comment of goodbye challenge, maybe they weren't wrong. In 2014, it was a goodbye challenge just not in the cancellation sense, but more of like a goodbye challenge in what we thought the challenge was prior to 2014 and free agents.